Osiris. Think of the biggest tree you've ever seen. Got it? Not even close. Think of roots that tap through bedrock into an underground ocean. Think of a canopy kissing clouds. Then they found it. They cut it down. That's what you need to see. No. Here, this story starts with a killing. Sugar Maple A musical fiction podcast from Osiris Media. One guitar, one mystery, one story told in eight episodes. Episode one. Sweet Licks, Bobby Lindro. August 7th, 1995, Lindridge Recording Studio, Sugar Maple, Episode 1, Take 5. This is the story of a guitar. A special guitar. How many guitars become legend? Enough of a legend to get known by a name. The one in this story did. A sweet 1951 Telecaster. One of the first ever made. Called by an equally sweet name. Sugar Maple. Damn. <laughs> I know I play a bad guitar, but I'm working on it. I'm a storyteller by trade. But half my life, I was a teller in search of a story. Who wondered if there was even a story for me to tell. But a story found me. An incredible one. And I'm finally ready to begin. This is the story of a very peculiar guitar and its many owners. Of the orphan who bought it. And the happy hambone man. The legend and the devil who disappeared. The country girl who escaped and the child who spoke with a tongue of fire. The bird who rose from the ashes. And then there's one who returned to tell the tale. Now last one's me. Call me Terrence. I'm going to be your guide on this journey. Ah, sorry. <laughs> You've heard of legendary guitars before, but none like this. This is the story of Sugar Maple. Stick around. My name is Rebecca Woodridge. Okay, the story starts... Well, this is 1975, so it would be, oh my God, 28 years ago. Bobby Lindro first came to live next door in 1947. I lived one farm over, so I saw him move in. 
an orphan boy my age with nothing to his name but a ratty suitcase and a cigar box guitar. I didn't think much of him sitting on Buggy's porch. He seemed stuck up. But in time, I learned he was just quiet and sad. I liked his Aunt Buggy. She was a tough broad whose preacher husband disappeared years ago. People whispered. Buggy paid no mind to talk or anything else. She cared for what was hers, and whenever what was hers was well cared for, she'd make music. She had an old wood body guitar, and her fingers were nimble. She'd play, I'd sing, and we'd talk. And the lemonade was sweet, and it was like having a grandma. I'd come sit on her porch most days. So it happened I was there about four years after Bobby's parents died on the hot summer day when he went into Chicago to win studio time at the W.I.N.D. Amateur Rock Contest and came back from the city with a broken neck. And here comes Bobby. That could be any car at all. No car has any reason to come down this road. Bobby must have caught a hitch. Early, though. You told him a hundred times the contest might not go his way. Big city, him just 18. That's only sense. I was a preacher's wife even longer than I've been a preacher's widow. I've never yet known a man with an idea in his head who could be convinced by sense. Bobby almost never talked, but he sure did play. All the time. (laughs) He wore that cigar box guitar down to splinters, and then another, and then another. He finally saved up enough to buy a real guitar of his own. She never said, but I suspect Buggy helped. It was one of those new shiny ones, a butterscotch, solid body, electric guitar. The contest was something Bobby'd had his sights on for months, even before he had his savings together for the Telecaster. They'd been advertising it on the radio all summer long, and the few words Bobby had to speak was about winning it. That boy had his hopes set. Well, we'll know soon enough. Here he comes. Bastards! What? Bobby, Lindro. Settle down. It can't have gone all that bad. What happened? They... they broke it. (gasps) We didn't see it at first, as I recall. He always carried it in a case. But he was swinging mad. I'd never seen him like this. When he swung that case against the porch rail, it broke open and we saw... Oh, Bobby... Oh, no. What happened? All I could think of was the years he'd worked to buy it, the years he'd spent picking out the one he wanted. The moment he had the last nickel, he was on the bus to the city to get it. He played it every day, polished it with a chamois every night, and now the neck was... They they killed it. No, boy, it's just... No, look at it. Well, the neck was broken, and I mean snapped in half. The truss rod was poking out like a spinal column. It wasn't hurt. It was... It's dead. It ain't dead. Just give it here and tell me what happened. Well, I I got to the contest. I played the first round, and I won. I, I beat some older guy with greaser hair who played his own song. I played T-Bone Walker. He couldn't compete with T-Bone. He stormed off the stage yelling when he lost. Body's intact. My next round wasn't for a couple hours. I went around the block to find a bite. I I should have stayed closer to the event. That's when they grabbed me. They? The loser's friends, his gang, they grabbed me. And then the bastard... Boy, language. He put my telly on the curb with the neck in the road and... Stomped on it? And came riding with his motorcycle and drove over it. And then they all ran away laughing. I guess he wanted that prize pretty bad. I hope it made him feel better. Nothing good ever happens. Everything goes. You come with me. Right now. You too, Becky. 
Where to? To see about repairs. Well, the neck is broke through. You can't fix it. Barn. I... Now, there's something to show you there. And maybe the walk will help you think twice about idiot ideas. Buggy never owned a car, which was why we called her Buggy in the first place. It wasn't unheard of in 1951, a woman still driving a horse and buggy, but it sure was unusual. We'd rib her about it, but it was her way, and Buggy would have her way. The barn where she kept them is where she took us. Auntie, the fretboard's busted. The truss rod snapped. The, the neck is what makes a telecaster special. It can't be fixed. Your great uncle wasn't just a preacher. He was a barnstormer, a revivalist. Reason I'm telling you is life on the road is tough, real tough. Things always broke. I got to know people. Don't just sit there, boy. Help me slide open this door. Folk who were handy at repair. I found this fella who could, well, Let's just say he worked wonders. So what I'm telling you is, when I say your guitar isn't dead, I know my business. A neck can't be replaced. Anything can be replaced. But why are we in the barn? What you need is wood with a little bit extra in it. And I know just the thing. Here... Under this tarp. Hold on. Lord, boy, you will just sit and watch an old woman work, won't you? I'll help. Holy... Oh, my. Hello, old friend. When we saw the thing underneath... It made a sound. It wasn't in my ears. It went all through me. I don't think Buggy noticed, but she seemed pleased with us, gasping at it. What we saw warranted gasps, with or without any sound. A pulpit made of the most amazing wood. The wood. Everybody talks about the wood. A grain like marble, or a, a cosmic tortoise shell, something liquid trapped in a moment of flow, polished, burnished, glowing. There's endless stories about sugar maple. And sure, the stories conflict like stories do. Not just in the details, but in key points. That's normal, actually. If you do enough interviews, you'll find memory is a, a slippery thing. What's less normal is consistency. And let me put it this way. I've heard dozens of people tell me dozens of things about sugar maple. Nobody, nobody has ever mistaken the look of the wood used to repair it. The guitar was only about a week being repaired. Bobby stayed too upset to play. He put it in the barn and left it for weeks or months. Weeks must have felt like months to him, considering it was the only stretch of time I ever saw him without a guitar. As it happened, I played it before he did. I should tell you about that. I was visiting for breakfast, and Buggy had sent me into the barn for something or other. What I remember is, it was there, propped up against the wall. The rising sun came in over the tree line through the door and hit it, and it, 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 it just gleamed. Hello, beauty. Hello, beauty. Better than new. A tally is a beauty anyway, but now, with that wood, I couldn't help myself. I picked it up and inspected the fix. 
whoever Buggy got to do it was a magician. You'd think it was part of the original design. I turned it over, and, and it was the strangest thing, but the repair on the neck wasn't just seamless. It, it reached down into the back body, almost like roots, as if the fix wasn't joined by the adhesive, but by the wood reaching into it. I'd done it before I even knew I'd done it. I wasn't plugged in, so it must have just made the sort of tinny sound an electric makes without juice, but I swear it had the snarl of electricity. Anyway, what I do remember is... Hey, are you playing my guitar? Well, you weren't playing it, Bobby Lindro. Give it here. Gee, does it really work? That's when I realized... Bobby hadn't kept away from his guitar because he was still angry. It was just he'd had so much taken from him that hadn't come back. He didn't dare let himself believe that something might be taken that would. That was that. He was back. He ran an extension and brought his amp. I borrowed Buggy's acoustic. I tried not to pay attention to what I'd noticed about Bobby's Telecaster, because memory's funny, you know? And the idea that the branches of wood growing into the back had grown further? Well, that was impossible. Before you know it, Delbert Fawcett from down the road hauled over his drum kit. By lunchtime, we had a band. That was October 12th, 1951. I know the date because I looked it up in the almanac. After all, Illinois hasn't had more than a dozen earthquakes recorded ever. Hey, why'd you cut out, boy? We were cooking. Uh, I, uh... Well, I thought that one sounded fine. The beat was off. The hell it was. We were cooking. (laughs) If you say so. I'm a regular metatome. Tell her, Bobby. Uh, I, uh... Go on. Maybe it was, uh... Just say what you think, Bobby. It just wasn't right. Because the beat was off. Oh, bull. You're only taking each other's sides because you're so sweet on each other. (laughs) Let's take it from the top. (laughs) Look at him. Look at him. Look at that boy blush. Regular fire hydrant. Don't tease him. And what about you? I guess you just come and listen to us play because you like Barnes so much. Listen to... Maybe if you just follow my rhythm over his lead, you'd be able to keep time for once, Delbert Fawcett. Take it from the top. I I don't... I don't know. Why'd you change my song? I can't explain. You don't know? You played it. Yeah, but it... uh, It's... You can't blame me for not keeping time if you're going to just change the song to me without no warning. Different how? I just sort of... Bobby, Lindra, will you just one time say what you're thinking? Uh, I sort of heard it in the guitar. Maybe... Maybe the guitar wanted to make that sound? (laughs) I didn't say it made any sense. Who cares about sense? Can you do it again? I don't know. Uh, Maybe? Fine. Just let me know when the change is coming this time. No, don't start with that old song. Play what he just did. In my band, we'll play my songs. Your band? Play it, Bobby. Walking through the sacred land Here I was, axe in hand Only taking what I need Not just whatever I see Till I saw her standing tall Great big limbs and all Everything else looked so small So I knew that tree was about to fall Keeps me warm all through 
through the night Brimstone lamp fire burning bright I kept her up for my own I built myself a little home Yeah, I put her to good use With four big walls and a solid roof Until I fell asleep one night Cat. It's already stopping. Let's play that again. Now? Well, we had something there. Get your sticks, boy. We're going again. <laughs> Bobby didn't even seem to notice the earthquake. He just wanted to play, and he didn't mind saying so. More tempo there, Dell. I was happy to see him finally doing something definite, to talk like he wasn't apologizing for having a thought of his own. Ah, see? And, and then right there, when I finish the bridge, you come in. But I guess looking back now, I can see how it was the start of his troubles. He was fixated. You might say possessed. There was something electric in his eyes that kept Del Fawcett mercifully quiet for once in his life. Del certainly didn't talk any more nonsense about it being his band. The only thing Del said was near the end of the day. <laughs> Those were some sweet licks, Bobby. Hey, look there. What? We could all see what Del was pointing at. One of the branches from the back body had grown around from the back to the front, reaching almost towards the pickups. Oh, oh, I told you. The guitar got busted. That's the wood that fixed it. Yeah, but on the front? Well, it must have been like that already. Uh, let's go again. And maybe Bobby was right. But in my memory, he sounded troubled when he said it. And that was the night the dreams first came for him. A huge tree. Too big for anything but a dream. You looked up and it went to the sky. Into the clouds. There were people all around the tree. They were dancing. Dancing. They said the tree would never die. They danced in fire, and they danced in day. They went up and around, and they said the tree knew them, and the tree would never die. Where they danced, their feet made paths, and they told me not to walk off the path of the dance, or everyone would die. But then the people changed, and so did the dancing. And then I stepped off the path, and the tree's shadow was on me. Almost I thought it could see me. And then I woke up. That's what he told me the next morning, after the barn burned. Bobby! Boy! Where are you going? Buggy saw Bobby tearing out across the front yard in his nightclothes far faster than Buggy could go afoot. It took her a while to hitch up the horse and head out down the road looking for him. It was almost an hour later before she found him, trotting ragged-footed about two miles down the road. By the time they returned, the barn was ablaze. Straw, beam, timber, and the rest of the pulpit, too. Buggy told me about it later. It's all gone. Bobby's great uncle back in revival days, he used to tell me things about that pulpit. Said he could feel it move through him, like it was sparking him to life almost, you see? I think so. Well, never mind whether you see or not. He said it. Crazy nonsense, likely, but I always thought it wasn't healthy. Felt like messing with forces we can't ever understand. 
That's why I covered it up in the first place. I can't even say why I decided to use it on Bobby's guitar. Some strange impulse. Never mind. Done is done. I just want to say, please watch Bobby for me. He listens to you. Tell him to take care. He says he was sleepwalking, Aunt Buggy. He didn't mean to do it. Nor do I think he did. But remember what I told you. Take care. Bobby didn't take care, though. I don't think. The guitar got him. In a way, it got me, too. Rebecca and Bobby's dreams came true for a while. They chipped in for a woolen sack reel-to-reel and recorded Brimstone Lampfire. Becky proved a tenacious enough promoter to get the tape in a radio producer's hands, which finally impressed somebody enough to offer them some studio time. I guess you'd have to say in the end, Bobby won that contest after all. Bobby and Becky got married in 56 and moved to Chicago and waited for their train to come in. There aren't many copies of Brimstone Lampfire remaining. It was a local hit, but the song isn't remembered by more than a few avid historians and some Chicago old-timers. I have a copy. Rebecca Woodridge gave it to me. Said she didn't want it anymore. It was happy at first in Chicago. We moved in right after the wedding. He did the thing where he carried me in over the door. <laughs> it was a mess. We wound up spilled on the floor. Ow, oh, Bobby, my head. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Are you okay? Yes, just a little bump. <laughs> Can I guess it better? <laughs> Only one way to find out. Mm. Come here. But before long, the bills piled up while the promises of summer never arrived. Well, what do they say? They said they're going in a different direction. What does that mean? A different direction? You can play any direction. It means not me, is what it means. Like always. Bobby gigged a bit around Chicago, but it wasn't the life either of us wanted. The manager says he can pay in two weeks. Well, the water and electric are due Friday, Bobby. Now, I'm aware of that, Rebecca. We fought, like all young couples, I suppose, but also not like... There was more behind it than most couples have. I could sense it. He never slept well, you know. Restless dreams. Wouldn't have been so bad if he didn't sleep talk. From the seed to the root. From the root to, to, to the branch. From the branch. Bobby, not from again. From the branch to, to the leaf. He just kept looking for something missing without finding it. We thought it might be a child, and it was, for me. But Bobby still tossed and turned in bed and in his life, and always with his Telecaster in his hands. It was like I was living with the guitar as much as with him. Bobby, stop playing guitar and take the baby. You woke him. He woke. I didn't wake him. It all broke open one night in spring. It had to. I forced it open. After we turned in, I woke him up and laid down the law. I'm still not sure whether or not that was for the best. You're going to talk to me. You're going to tell me what's eating you and we'll sit here awake and quiet until you do. If you fall asleep, I'll shake you awake. Look, I... I don't know what to say. I never know what to say. I, I can't talk. It, the words won't happen. It's the same when I try to make another song. Something's blocking it all. You know the words to say, Bobby Lindro. Don't tell me otherwise. You know. You just don't want to say because you think as long as there aren't words for you to say, it's not real. Just leave it be. It doesn't matter. We've been good, haven't we? Haven't we had good times? I don't want to talk about good times. I want to talk about now. What's... The dreams. They're just dreams. That's all. They're always about leaving. Leaving? About me leaving. I see. 
Well, I don't want to. Oh, yes. You just dream about it every night. What's that? I, I think it's the guitar. Oh. It keeps telling me there... There's somewhere else I need to be. Almost a fear not to be there. Bobby, the guitar? You're going to blame the guitar? Well, it must be. I don't want to go. All my life, everything's always left me. I never want to be the one to go. Well, I don't know what I was expecting. But it wasn't this. When I play it, I... I see things sometimes. Other places, other people. I, I see a huge crowd. I, I don't know what it means. It means you dream of leaving. I... Uh, Becky... This is actually simple. Your dreams aren't because of your guitar. You know that, Bobby, right? You're disappointed. Well, guess what? So am I. Do you think I wanted this for us? No. Well, you better figure out pretty quickly what you do want. Because the way it's been, I won't live with it. We were silent then. Just sitting together in a molten pool of things said you can't take back. Presently, we both pretended to be asleep. I was probably drifting off for real when I heard him get up as quiet as he could and put on clothes and shoes and coat, grabbing his guitar, of course. And then I followed. It's the only time I ever did anything like leaving a little baby behind. I still can't believe I took the risk. Bobby was already on the corner and turning when I got downstairs, far enough away I couldn't have been sure it was him if not for the guitar strapped on his back. It didn't take too long to see where he was heading. There was a trestle stretching right past our building leading to a ground level track, which ran into a nearby switchyard where all the rails started to run together. Bobby scrambled down an embankment and started crossing all those tracks. I stayed up at the top and watched him as he walked toward a freighter that was just starting to move by inches, lurching, building momentum. He came up to a car with the door half open and I, I could, uh, I could barely breathe. I couldn't believe he was actually leaving. We'd just been together in bed. The train was gathering speed, and Bobby had to jog a bit to keep up. I watched as Bobby took the guitar off his back and set it gently into the car, and then shoved it deeper inside as he jogged along. I watched. Next, he'd hop in. Just a man in his axe, walking through the sacred land. How romantic. But then he slowed and stopped and watched the train go off. He stood there for a long time. When he saw me on the way back, he didn't look surprised I'd followed. He just climbed up, gave me his coat, and said, Okay, let's go home. You know the rest. Less than a month later, he left anyway. Maybe his guitar wanted him to leave, but it turns out so did he. No object makes you do things. The most a thing can do is bring out what was there already. Guitars don't make the earth move beneath your feet. Your feet do the moving. He wanted a career and he got one. He did just fine for himself. I saw him once, 10 years ago now, back on Aunt Buggy's farm where it all began. Maybe I'll tell you someday. Not today. I'm tired. I've made a, a certain level of peace with the man, but he made his choices. I won't allow him to put the blame on that damn Telecaster, no matter what it may have done to him. But I'll also say, I do think it's something more than just a guitar. Memory's funny, and I know what I know. Those branches spread on the back body after I played those seven notes. Before the earthquake, there was no branch reaching around to the front. And I still dream about it, too. I dream about Bobby's tree. 
I dream it all the time. Every time I do, I hear it singing those same seven notes I played years ago on Bobby's Tally. It feels like it wants me to sing them back. Sweet Licks Bobby Lindro recorded many times, but you'll only find him in the fine print of liner notes. He became a studio man through the 60s and 70s. Rebecca said, now, you know what? What the hell with this? Rebecca Woodridge wasn't the last witness to the Sugar Maple guitar. In fact, she was just the first and easiest to find. I went into the living room one day and asked her. Rebecca Woodridge was my mother. My father was Sweet Licks Bobby Lindro. I was the baby he left behind. My name is Terrence Woodridge. Sugar Maple's still out there. I've got to find it. Sugar Maple is presented by Osiris Media. Be sure to listen to the premiere of Brimstone Lampfire on March 15th, wherever you listen to music. To check out the limited edition poster for this episode, visit SugarMapleArt.com. And for a limited NFT release of episode and series art, visit SugarMapleNFT.com. If you like what you hear, please give us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Sugar Maple Episode 1 stars Fred Savage as Terrence Woodridge, Ricky G as Bobby Lindro, Connie Costanzo as Becky, Joe Walker as Rebecca Woodridge, Deborah Geffner as Aunt Buggy, Daniel Light as Del Fawcett, and Michelle Hurst as Doc. Brimstone Lampfire was written by Patrick Hart and Michael John Hancock. The executive producers of Sugar Maple are Tom Marshall and RJB. The show was produced, edited, sound designed, mixed, and mastered by Brad Stratton. Story by Ben Colmery, A.R. Moxon, and Tom Marshall. Episode 1, written by A.R. Moxon and Ben Colmery. Directed by James Massiovecchio. Musical direction by Don Hart. Assistant editor and producer, Tom Sullivan. Production assistance by Zach Brogan and Christina Collins. Art by Mark Dowd. Legal assistance by Gerald Gottesman. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Sugar Maple. And remember, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. See you next week. Osiris. Oh,